In the case of Helena, we sat down collaboratively and talked a lot about what we wanted to do in that uh, a precious amount of time we had, that Helena and I had something profound in common. And that is we both assumed the gun was empty. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You why, why speak out now? Well, I think that um, I felt there were a number of misconceptions, most of it from sources I really wouldn't concern myself about, but a couple that I did concern myself about, where there were these authoritative statements about this is what happened. In statement analysis, we note what's sensitive to a subject. In this passage, where the interviewer asks Baldwin why he speaks out now, it's sensitive to Baldwin to say that most of the misconceptions are from sources that he allegedly doesn't concern himself about. Thus, he minimizes the number of serious or reliable sources, according to him, that is. This short passage sets the tone for the rest of the interview, Baldwin's aim to protect himself. We can call it self-protective strategies or linguistic self-defense. Let's see how the strategies play out. In an interview like this, even though, or maybe exactly because it's called unscripted, it's expected that the subjects thought a lot about how to formulate the statements. Before we get to it though, if you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. Thanks for watching. In the case of Helena, we sat down collaboratively and talked a lot about what we wanted to do in that uh, a precious amount of time we had. But um, I, I, I want to make sure that I don't come across like I'm the victim because we have two victims here. And the second thing is, is that all of what happened on that day leading up to this event was precipitated on one idea, and that is that Helena and I had something profound in common. And that is we both assumed the gun was empty, other than those, you know, uh, dummy rounds. Baldwin states that he and Helena sat down and talked a lot about what they wanted to do in that precious amount of time they had. With the adjective precious, Baldwin emphasizes that he hasn't taken the time he spent with Helena for granted. It ascribes humility to his personality and can help him seem sympathetic, whether he's conscious of his linguistic choices or not. The important thing is that it's a consistent pattern throughout this interview thereby suggesting an intention on Baldwin's part. What he does seem directly conscious of, however, is to underline that he's not a victim, because as he says, there are two victims, Helena and Joe. He repeats his non-victim status, so this is urgent to Baldwin. My concern is that I don't sound like I'm the victim. I want to make sure that I don't come across like I'm the victim, because we have two victims here. Also, notice how his formulation because we have two victims here, with the collective personal pronoun we mimics the general public. It mimics the possible objection to his participation in this interview, and he makes sure to anticipate this objection. This, along with his humility, is part of his self-protective strategies. Previously, I mentioned the concept sensitivity, and we notice it again in this prolonged sentence. I call it prolonged because the conjunction AND, which has a paratactic function, is repeated. This doubles the sensitivity of the information he seeks to convey. Notice how he phrases it. He says, And the second thing is, is that all of what happened on that day leading up to this event was precipitated on one idea, and that is... Here's the second AND I mentioned, still leading up to the primary information of this sentence. That Helena and I had something profound in common. And that is, we both assumed the gun was empty. Before he finally gets to the actual grammatical subjects, Helena and I, in the dependent clause, he first makes all of what happened the grammatical subject. This lengthy and largely indirect way of phrasing it suggests that he's very careful about what he says and how he says it. This likely speaks to his initial words, I want to make sure. These words point to a clear agenda, possible rehearsal of some of the sentences he uses. At least, this is something we should be aware of as a possibility. When he says Helena and I had something profound in common, he performs association. Association is when a speaker makes it sound like they're not alone in feeling or thinking a certain way. Association is common in everyday conversations, and it's not always worth noting. But in this particular conversation, 
it's relevant that Baldwin aligns himself with Helena. Even though he's repeatedly stated that he doesn't want to sound like a victim, he still aligns himself with the victim. He does the same when he says that they both assume that the gun was empty. Profound is a noteworthy word choice. He doesn't say terrible or horrible or something similar. Profound echoes the adjective precious that he used earlier, the deep connection between the two, allegedly. He said, because we have some issues here. I said, such as, and he said, my men need a better hotel room. There was no mention of safety issues. This is Baldwin's response to the rumors of potential safety issues on set. We notice that the denial is placed in the end and not the beginning. It's prefaced by direct quotes. Direct quotes belong to the category, vivid language, dramatizing for the interviewer and the viewers. Baldwin does this a lot. Again, this functions as prolonging. Sometimes subjects use direct quotes or presume direct quotes to buy more time. However, and I think this is more likely to be the case here, using direct quotes ensures a high level of ethos, at least linguistically. He didn't say anything about the accidental he discharges on set? He didn't say anything about anything. He goes, my men need better hotel rooms. I said, well, we're leaving, we're wrapping. Will you be here tomorrow? He said, yes. The interviewer asks if Lane, the camera assistant who cited safety concerns, didn't say anything about the discharges on set. Notice how Baldwin answers. He parrots the first part of the interviewer's question. He didn't say anything, but then changes the latter part to about anything other. Parroting shows that the subject's attending to the interviewer's question in detail. But here, Baldwin changes the last part to something more general and also conclusive. Furthermore, we notice the continuation of vivid language in form of several alleged direct quotes. When people say a cutting costs, I don't say this with any judgment or any cynicism. Spielberg wants to save money. Tom Cruise wants to save money. Everybody who makes movies has a responsibility not to be reckless and careless with the money that you're given. We know that those are men who make movies that cost $205 million. And I'm making movies that cost $5 million. Or the question, pounds. though, is were costs being cut at the expense of safety and security? Well, in, in, my, in my opinion, no, because I did not, now, I did not observe any safety or security issues at all in the time I was there. The interviewer asks if the costs were being cut at the expense of safety and security. We should pay attention to Baldwin's hitching language in form of the phrase, in my opinion. Hitches are used to indicate probability rather than certainty. Also, he starts with a self-repair, which is a self-initiated interruption of a self-initiated utterance. He makes another self-repair before he says that he did not observe any of these issues. In this context, self-repair suggests a certain level of internal stress, perhaps caused by the interviewer's assertive way of stating this. The question, though, is were costs being cut at the expense of safety and security? Prior to the second self-repair, there's a micropause after the hypotactic conjunction because. Hypotaxis marks dependency between clauses. However, this dependency is not initiated immediately. We can tell that from the micropause. When we combine these observations, we have an unassertive denial, which continues being unassertive. Because we should also note where Baldwin places emphasis. He places emphasis on I and observe thus continuing with this subjective viewpoint when he says that he did not observe any safety or security issues. This leaves room for doubt, room for other possibilities. The uncertainty is further emphasized by the qualifier in the time I was there. The qualifier strengthen or weaken an assertion. Here the qualifier weakens his assertion that he did not observe any of these issues. Any is strong language, but it's weakened by the qualifier. Lastly, I say did not, because that's what Baldwin says, without contraction. Some language experts speculate that absence of contraction further weakens a denial, making it overly convincing. In conclusion, the most reasonable thing is to consider the possibility that Baldwin could have knowledge that he doesn't reveal here, that he might know something else from when he wasn't physically present. The amount of care, these are people who are professionals, who have really good jobs in a field they love. 
And I looked at all these people and, and I see how hard they work. In this passage, Baldwin again displays humility. Humility before the people on set who worked hard, as he says. To leave my family for four weeks and go shoot this movie, shoot this movie that was a big deal. And I'm sitting on this, this pew. And so help me God. I sat on that pew right before they called lunch. And I said, this movie has made me love making movies again. The personalization continues as he states how it was a big deal for him to leave his family for four weeks to shoot the movie. More than just humility, he displays an everyday man quality in this passage. He portrays himself as a family person, something that most people can relate to, whether they're in Hollywood or not. This everyday man or regular quality is important for identification. In narrative theory, Robert Rowland states that the overall purpose of narratives is to get the audience to identify with the narrator's thoughts and feelings. Here, Baldwin's the narrator, and we are the audience, evaluating his quote-unquote performance. Rowland states that a compelling plot and an emotional theme help transport the audience to the narrator's life and thus point of view, and help tap into shared human values in order to elicit an emotional reaction. We can't know how audiences react to Baldwin's narrative, but we can confirm that it has an emotional theme with the potential of people recognizing themselves in the thoughts and, more importantly, the feelings he shares. Roland calls it the synergy between narrative form and narrative function. Compelling form elements result in convincing function elements. We note Baldwin's appeal to deity, and so help me God, almost as if he's sitting in court. On a surface level, this is another display of humility, of a person suffering, However, in statement analysis, it's understood that deceptive people are more likely than truthful people to use mild oaths and idioms in quote-unquote uncomfortable contexts. They're more likely to appeal to deity for self-serving reasons, as it's the ultimate appeal to a greater authority. This is not to say that Baldwin's deceptive about the events he describes, but it could mean that he's deceptive as in overly persuasive in coming across as genuine and heartfelt. It could indicate that he's trying too hard. And you were rehearsing that scene. Was it an actual rehearsal? There's some disagreement about that, whether it was a formal rehearsal at that time. This is a marking rehearsal, where you, I'm going to show her. She's standing next to the camera. She's like this. You're me. She's got a monitor here. The camera is here filming that way. She takes a monitor that, his, that is his monitor, the operator, and turns it toward her. It swivels. And she says to me, hold the gun lower. Go to your right. Okay, right there. All right, do that. Now show it a little bit lower. And she's getting me to position the gun. Everything is in her direction. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle. And I, I draw the gun out, and I find a mark. I draw the gun out, and I find a cut. And what's really urgent is the gun wasn't meant to be fired in that angle. In this passage, where the interviewer states that there's some disagreement about whether it was a formal rehearsal, it's obviously sensitive to Baldwin to emphasize two things. One, association, and two, to highlight that he was largely instructed on what to do. This is an important type of self-defense, so that it doesn't seem like he acted irresponsibly. We notice association when he tells the interviewer, you're me, involving the interviewer in his reenactment of what happened. This way, the interviewer observes the situation from Baldwin's point of view. Also, this is a great way for Baldwin to involve the audience, the viewers. Then, notice the many grammatical subjects, starting with she, referring to Helena. Helena's made the primary character in Baldwin's narrative. She takes a monitor. She says to me, she's getting me to position the gun. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle. He only refers to himself as I once he's detailed all of Helena's instructions. This is important. Because he associates with Helena like this, he's then not directly to blame for what happened. Linguistically speaking, I'm shooting just off. Just off. Right. In her direction. I'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it, which ended up being aimed right in below her armpit. It was what I was told. I don't know. This was a completely incidental shot, an angle that may not have ended up in the film at all. But we kept doing this. And so then I said to her, now in this scene, I'm going to cock the gun. 
I said, do you want to see that? And she said, yes. So I take the gun and I start to cock the gun. I'm not going to pull the trigger. Even though Baldwin admits to drawing the gun out, he largely portrays himself as passive rather than an instigator. Notice what he says. I'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it and which ended up being aimed right below her armpit is what I was told. We should pay attention to how he uses direct quotes, vivid language, in order to emphasize that he didn't do anything before he had informed the victim, Helena. Note the causality. He says that he asked Helena if she wanted to see him going for the gun. She said yes, and then he took the gun. With so, he himself points to this causality. The causality between Helena's instructions and what he did as a result of these instructions. I, I said, do you see that? She goes, well, just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that. And I cock the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. It's urgent to Baldwin to underline that Helena was cooperating with him this entire time. He continues with the same type of causality. The most important point in this passage, which again underlines the more or less passive role he's interested in having, is when he says the gun goes off. The gun is made the grammatical subject in the latter part of the sentence. This is a foreshadowing that Baldwin didn't pull the trigger, which he claims in the next passage. The decisive that was moment. the moment the gun went off, yeah. That was the moment the gun went off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. Here, Baldwin keeps making the gun the grammatical subject. Twice, he repeats, the gun went off. He switches to the personal pronoun I, thus making him the active agent, when doing so takes the blame off of him, because he says, I didn't pull the trigger. This is the most significant statement in the entire interview, and the self-protective strategies that we've observed have all led up to this denial. You never pulled the trigger. No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger. On day one of my instruction in this business, people said to me, never take a gun and go click, 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 because even though it's incremental, you damage the firing pin on the gun if you do that. Don't do that. In and of itself, Baldwin's claim to not having pulled the trigger is a so-called reliable denial. It contains the personal pronoun I, followed by a negation, followed by the grammatical object. In this passage, however, he switches to never, as he states that he would never point a gun at anyone. Never is not the same as saying didn't. Didn't refers to the specific situation, whereas never is general. This means that the subject's not necessarily denying the action, but is stating that this is something he would in no way do, and that's different. Baldwin goes on to provide backing for his claim. The people that told him to never take a gun and go click as he phrases it. So once more, he's quick to point to other people for backup. In this video, we've observed different strategies that point to the same thing. To portray Baldwin as humble, as a family man, and following instructions. Linguistically, these strategies are there to contradict the notion that he acted irresponsibly. Thanks for your time.